First impressions are everything, and this is especially true when it comes to hooking an audience on a new series. And while there are many factors that could contribute to a series' success, character design is perhaps the most important in terms of captivating an audience and drawing them into the story that the author is trying to tell. This, of course, might not be the most relevant thing when it comes to novels, but in visual mediums like anime, manga, and film, it can offer a very strong first impression. There's the old expression that you can't judge a book by its cover, and that is absolutely true. However, it is the cover, the title, and in this case, the visuals being presented that give you an insight into the story. You might not be able to tell how good the series is just by these things, but you can at least get a quick gauge as to if this is something that would be interesting to you as an individual. A well-designed character can create an immediate emotional connection with the viewers, setting the tone for the entire series and leaving a lasting impression. And while many series do tremendously impressive things with character design, I think in terms of offering a very easy to understand and comprehensive perspective, Kohei Horikoshi's My Hero Academia is just something truly special. But before we get into the actual video, we gotta do the YouTube stuff. So if you're enjoying the content here on Axelbeats, remember to leave a like and subscribe so that you don't miss anything else that I put out. And if you're looking to support the channel a little bit extra, please consider supporting me over on Patreon or by becoming a member here on YouTube. With all that said though, let's get back to the video. So off the bat, let's talk about the core elements that act as the building blocks of character design. These are style, story, shape, color, wardrobe, face, and body language. Or the really handy acronym, SQUIF. Thank God for SQUIF, making this such an easy thing to remember. Starting off, we have style. And this could be a full video on its own in the future, but visual and artistic style are at the core of how the story feels. And in the majority of cases, this acts as a foundational piece as to how characters will be designed as well. The style of a story's art can immediately communicate the mood, genre, and overall tone of that story. For example, a dark and gritty story might use a lot of black and muted colors to convey a sense of foreboding while a light-hearted comedy might use bright colors and simple shapes to create a playful atmosphere. One example of how visual style can communicate atmosphere of a story can be seen in Attack on Titan. The series takes place in a dystopian world where humanity is on the brink of extinction due to attacks from titans. And so, the art style of the series uses a lot of thick, bold lines and intense shading to create a sense of weight and danger. The characters are often shown in extreme close-ups with distorted faces, conveying their fear and desperation in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. This visual style helps to establish the dark, intense tones of the series and hook viewers in by immersing them into the world of that story. Then there's Maiden Abyss, a personal favorite of mine. This is a fantasy adventure series that follows a young girl named Rico as she sets out on a journey to find her mother in the mysterious and treacherous abyss. This series features a unique art style that has a lot of soft, watercolor-like backgrounds and character designs that really ride the line between both cute and unsettling. The use of contrasting colors, lighting, and textures creates a sense of wonder and danger, all acting together to draw in the audience into the world of the Abyss. The character designs are mostly adorable, which is kind of misaligned with the horrific monsters, the injuries, and the traumatic events that you experience within this journey. This disconnect amplifies the overall effect of this hauntingly beautiful and immersive world that captures the sense of wonder and danger that they're exploring. In each of these cases, though, we're looking at something fairly unique that stands out and immediately makes a name for itself. And the same can kind of be said for My Hero Academia. MHA is a superhero action series that takes place in a world where most people have a unique superpower called a quirk. The art style of the series is bold and energetic. It uses dynamic poses, exaggerated expressions, and bright colors. The character designs are distinctive and memorable, each reflecting the character's personalities and abilities. The use of visual effects such as motion lines and sound effects also contribute to the overall energy of the series, creating a sense of excitement and momentum that draws the audience into this larger-than-life world of heroes. And it is no coincidence that its rise to popularity is in the mid-2010s, a period where the MCU had just released the Avengers and where superhero fever was in full swing. 
Horikoshi himself is a massive fan of Western comics, and more so than just about any other manga series I've seen at the time, he has an art style that is heavily inspired by publications like Marvel and DC, and you see this really being shown off in characters like All Might, Present Mike, and Twice, who fit almost perfectly into characters that Western audiences might have known or grown up with. And that familiarity with the superhero genre opened the series up to the world in a way that very few other manga or anime have. This period was kind of a renaissance for anime in a way that Dragon Ball and The Big Three had been a decade and a half previous. There had been fans of anime in North America for a while at this point, but it was by no means mainstream. But suddenly, we had a string of extremely accessible series. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood in 2009, Hunter x Hunter's Remake in 2011, Attack on Titan in 2013, One Punch Man in 2015, and suddenly people were talking about anime more and more as it came in forms that were more accessible to the Western audiences. But there would be an absolute explosion in 2016 with My Hero Academia. A series that popped off so much that I remember my 50-year-old mother coming home from work one day and asking if I had seen it and wanting to watch it together. This show was everywhere. Anime had this weird stigma up to the early 2000s where when average people thought about it, they would jump to one of three things. Over-the-top reactions like you might see in Japanese game shows, shows where people scream things like Dragon Ball Z, or just straight-up hentai. But then MHA rolled up, and to explain this show to people, you would just say, yo, there's this Japanese superhero show. And that's it! In a time when superheroes were already crazy popular, and when people finally got around to watching it, they would find familiar character archetypes to latch onto. By taking inspiration from Western superhero comics, Horikoshi had been able to create a series that felt familiar and accessible to Western audiences, while also incorporating unique and original elements that made it stand out. The use of these familiar archetypes and visual tropes, as well as dynamic and energetic art styles, all contribute to the appeal that My Hero Academia had to audiences around the world, and all of that plays into the foundation of design that each character would be built up from. So now we know how MHA made its mark and when, but let's talk about the specific elements of character design that are used in the series which allow for it to be so welcoming to such a wide audience. Once the general style has been established, there are a few paths that a creator can follow, building up from either themes or specific ideas as the basis for their characters. In a 2018 interview, Horikoshi explains that first and foremost when it comes to creating characters, he often considers their personalities and their story arcs creating a sense of what visual cues might work to expand upon and explore those concepts. Though admittedly, he also talks about sometimes having instances where he would just see a tape dispenser and think, there could be a face in that, and starts a character from there. For example, we have characters such as Shoto Todoroki. His story is quite literally all over his face. Shoto is a cool guy with a burning passion, and he's given a quirk that matches that concept, being half hot, half cold. He can manifest ice from his right side and fire from his left, meaning that by default, his abilities are at odds with themselves. It's an unnatural mix of polar opposites. Physically, we see this taking shape in his hair, being white and red divided up the middle. Not only that, but on the fiery side of his face, you have a burn mark around his eye. As we learn about him, we find out about his family. He has an abusive father, Endeavor, who is the number two hero, and a mother who was driven to the edge as she dealt with the tyrannical living conditions her husband put in place. Endeavor had wanted a perfect heir who could make the most of his fire quirk and his wife's ice quirk so that they could surpass All Might. However, as conditions in the home began to worsen, Rey started seeing Endeavor within the red half of her son and eventually took out her negative feelings on him, burning his face with boiling water. And when you look at his character design, all of that is referenced all at once. His father's eugenics-like quirk marriage aimed at creating someone with both fire and ice shown in his hair. The fiery half of his face being scarred, alluding to a potentially dangerous relationship with his father who shared that quirk. It is simple details like that that can both be built up by a character's story, but also be used to build up that story as well. But the example that I personally think holds the most value, though, is the changing design in Deku's character throughout the series. Not exactly a representation of where he comes from, like in the case of Todoroki, but a demonstration of where he is in his story right now. 
One of the clearest examples is the scars that using One For All leaves on his body. I've always very much appreciated the emphasis that MHA places on demonstrating the hardships and growth that Deku has experienced, but scars take many forms, and we see the mental and morale damage that he's taken being put on full display through his hero costume. It is no coincidence that his first costume is so drastically different than those that followed. In this design, he has a far brighter and more optimistic color scheme. He has a smile painted across his face. He has those big ears based on All Might's iconic hair. This is how he saw being a hero as he was a child. It's bright, it's happy, it's the symbolic image that All Might had been trying to present to everyone, which Deku bought into entirely. And then we move on to his second costume. It's darker, but it still has very hopeful colors. The image of All Might is gone as he tries to find out who he is as a hero and begins to move out of All Might's shadow, and that painted on smile that he had has become a bit of armor. But let's move forward to the current season of the anime where everything has come crashing down and all of these symbols that people had believed in have been put into question, and where Deku is acting more as a vigilante rather than a hero. Deku's costume is ragged and frayed all over. He is worn down and it shows. The bunny ears have returned, but they aren't anything like they used to be. They don't look like a reflection of the symbol of peace, so much as they are deflated and destitute. We also have the addition of Gran Torino's cape, which is equally torn apart. This cape was given to Deku as Gran Torino was telling him about how death can also be a form of salvation. This isn't that hopeful All Might fan who had his mom's funny costume back in the first season. This is someone who's come face to face with the reality of the hero world he lives in, as well as all the darkness that surrounds it. He isn't a quirkless kid trying to save everyone. He is one of the strongest heroes in the world, questioning the morality of taking someone's life to protect other people. He isn't put together, bright and clean. He is tattered, scarred, and dark. You don't even need to really know the plot of the series. If I show you the way that his design has changed over time, you just innately feel his story. You can see the arc of a hopeful kid becoming jaded and broken without any need for words, and that's exactly why I believe Deku is one of the simplest and most effective demonstrations to tell a story using only a character's design. It's all there even if you don't know what happened, but if you do know, if you've traveled that path with him throughout the manga, throughout the anime, suddenly every frayed thread, every scar on his arm, it all reinforces everything we've experienced so far and reminds us of how far the character has come. A character's story can be used to inform their personality, create conflicts, develop an audience's empathy towards them, or to drive the overall plot forward. And the design of a character can act as a vehicle to bring all of these points to the viewer and make them more accessible and available to them. But everything we've talked about to this point has kind of been all-encompassing features. Things like style, personality, and story often act as thematic through lines that inform other design choices. Once they have been established, we can zoom in a bit and focus on character-specific elements such as shape and proportion. These can play a major role in the overall appeal of a character, as well as their general look and feel. The right combination of shapes and proportions can give a character a silhouette that makes them instantly recognizable, while the wrong combination could lead to them feeling unbalanced or unappealing. Anime characters in general are often known for their exaggerated proportions, such as large eyes, small nose, or having spiky hair. These features help to distinguish characters from each other and really put their personalities on display. One of the biggest benefits when working with an illustrated medium like anime or manga, as opposed to a live action series, is that these features are much more malleable and there's more room for playing with the extremes. Body proportions can be exaggerated so that characters may have long limbs, long necks, or slim bodies that differ from realistic proportions. This can also help to create a sense of fluidity and movement in characters' designs, as well as to emphasize their physical abilities or characteristics. In real life, people come in almost all shapes and sizes, but you just aren't going to get that flexibility or leeway for exaggeration that allows for characters like All Might to exist. I mean, yeah, we got some big muscle heads, but we don't have too many 7 foot tall, 500 pound of muscle characters in real life, you know? And having that freedom can really help with making them feel larger than life because, well, they are. 
And it isn't limited to body shape, we can also look at individual features. For example, many anime characters have those larger eyes I mentioned, which is done to make the characters look more expressive and emotive, as well as to draw attention to their eyes as a focal point for the audience. Other features, such as the nose, mouth, or ears, may be downplayed or simplified to keep that focus on the eyes. The shape of a character's body can also be used to convey different personalities or emotions. Circles and roundness are often associated with softer, more gentle personalities. Characters with those round shapes in their design, such as rounded faces or curved body lines, may be perceived as cute, friendly, or approachable. Roundness can also be used to convey a sense of youthfulness or innocence. We can look at characters like Ochako, who is almost entirely made up of circles, and she is the embodiment of friendly and cute. The waviness in Deku's hair is used to show off innocence, and Fatgum is just kinda all of the above and is all around carefree most of the time. We can also work with squares or rigidity. These are often associated with more serious or disciplined personalities. Characters with rigid shapes in their design, such as straight lines or boxy features, may be perceived to be more powerful, aggressive, or stoic. The use of rigid shapes can help to create a sense of tension or intensity. If we look to characters in MHA, we have Ida, who is almost always framed in rigid positions, or Shoji and Ojiro, whose hair are very boxy and flat, which aligns these characters with the ideas of them being more serious and disciplined. And of course, Kirishima is more or less all straight lines, especially when using his quirk, which leans into him being very dependable and strong. Triangles and sharpness are other elements which can be used to convey strength or speed. Characters with sharp features, such as sharp eyes, pointed ears, or spiky hair, may be seen as more aggressive or dangerous. Sharpness can also be used to convey a sense of precision or control, which is often seen in characters who are skilled or knowledgeable in a particular area. Tokoyami is basically all triangles as he rides that line of being very skilled and serious. Bakugo has a lot of sharp points in his design, and his whole thing is being aggressive and dangerous. Of course, all of these elements can also be combined for different effects as well. For example, look at Kaminari and Mina. You have plenty of round and wavy bits coming to a peak with sharp edges. This shows off that these characters are friendly and energetic. They lean into both categories. In addition to conveying personality traits, roundness, rigidity, and sharpness can also be used to create a sense of movement and depth in a character's design. Roundness can create a sense of fluidity and grace in a character's movements, while rigidity and sharpness can create a sense of tension or impact. By combining these elements in different ways, character designers can create unique and dynamic characters that stand out and capture the audience's attention. Here I briefly want to take a moment to talk about two characters who change shape throughout the series, those being fat Gum and All Might. In Fat Gum's case, he's typically presented as this big, round, lovable dude who is always friendly and fun, and of course with a body type that matches that. But what happens when he uses his quirk, and things become serious? Fat Gum's quirk, Fat Absorption, turns his fat into kinetic energy to boost up his attacks. And as a result, in extreme situations, we see him losing that plump exterior and instead shriveling down to more sharp and rigid lines to match that situation. In All Might's case, we have his big form, where he appears to be a muscular and imposing figure with exaggerated features such as bulging muscles and a prominent jawline. This design emphasizes his strength and the larger-than-life nature of his hero persona. He's meant to look like a hero, to be powerful, stable, and reassuring, and because of that we have a lot of these square elements all over his design. In contrast, Small Might appears frail and weak, with a noticeably thinner and more fragile appearance. This design represents the toll that being a hero has taken on him, and reflects the fact that he is no longer the invincible hero he was seen to be. He has a lot of triangles showing that there is danger. There are these weak, flimsy lines. He is weak, he is frail, he's drawn in an unbalanced way. There is no sense of stability or comfort to be found anywhere in this design. These are the same characters that they always were, however, depicting them in different shapes allows for a vastly different feeling to be associated with who they are. This element of shape can also be supplemented with the use of color 
color to convey more precise expressions of the traits that authors and artists are trying to attribute a certain character with. Color may be used to convey personality traits, emotion, or any other aspect of a character's identity. And especially in a series where color is so forward-focused, as it is with My Hero Academia, this effect is almost amplified. That said, color is obviously a massive spectrum, and red, for example, could be attributed with characters like this, or this, or this, and each different shade or hue tends to have their own meaning or feelings associated with them. For instance, a brighter and more vibrant color might be used to convey a character's more lively or energetic personality, while a muted or darker color might indicate a more reserved or brooding personality. Similarly, warmer colors like reds, oranges, and yellows could convey passion, energy, or excitement, while cooler colors such as blues and greens can be used to convey calmness and serenity. Colors can also be used to convey themes and mood. For example, a character designed with darker colors might be associated with a more ominous or foreboding mood, while a character designed with brighter colors might be associated with a more lighthearted or playful one. With that said, let's take a look at specific colors and what their meanings can be, as well as how Horikoshi shows them off with his characters. We can start with red. Red, when used positively, is often associated with passion, strength, and courage. When used negatively, you might think of intensity or danger. Characters with red in their design might be perceived as energetic, determined, or confident. Brighter and more vibrant shades of red might be associated with passion or boldness. This can be useful in designing characters that are confident, daring, or who have fiery personalities. On the other hand, darker and more muted shades of red can be associated with danger, anger, and evil. This is useful in designing characters who are menacing, intimidating, and villainous. The hero Killer Stain and Endeavor both make use of these deeper, dark reds. Blue is a color that is often associated with calmness, serenity, and trust. Characters with blue in their design may be perceived as peaceful, trustworthy, and dependable. Brighter shades of blue might show off clarity or purity, making it a good choice for characters that are rational or analytical. On the other hand, darker shades of blue can be associated with sadness, depression, or even coldness. This can be useful in designing characters that are aloof, melancholic, or villainous. Dark blue can give off a sense of mystery or depth, making it a good choice for characters who are complex or enigmatic. Blue is often one of those colors that we more specifically focus on the hue of as well. For instance, a turquoise or a teal blue might be associated with the ocean or nature, while a navy blue might be associated more with authority or professionalism. Green is a color that shows off nature, growth, and balance. Characters with green in their design may be perceived as calm, peaceful, and harmonious. Brighter shades can be associated with vitality and freshness, making it a good choice for characters who are very lively. On the other hand, darker shades of green can be associated with things like envy, greed, or illness. This can be useful in designing characters who are manipulative or unwell. Yellow is often associated with happiness, warmth, and positivity, and characters who show off yellow in their design might be perceived as cheerful, optimistic, or outgoing. Brighter shades can be associated with energy and enthusiasm, making it a good choice for characters who are more animated and friendly. For example, you might use yellow in a character who is very hopeful and positive. On the other hand, yellow can also have negative connotations such as cowardice, caution, or illness. This can be useful in designing characters who are timid or sickly. Lighter shades might give you a feel of fragility or vulnerability, making it a good choice for characters who need to be protected or cared for. Purple is often associated with mystery, sophistication, and royalty. Characters with purple in their design may be shown to be enigmatic, elegant, and powerful. Purple, when used positively, is often associated with luxury, creativity, and a sense of regality. Brighter shades are often used with thoughtful, creative, and imaginative characters, making it a good choice for artistic or unconventional characters. Purple also has a bit of a mystical vibe to it. A wizard or magical creature might be designed with purple robes or features to convey an otherworldly nature. On the other hand, darker shades of purple can be associated with things like sadness or melancholy. This can be useful in designing characters that are brooding or tragic. Dark purple can be used to convey a sense of suspense or mystery, making it a good choice for very secretive characters. Pink is a color that is often associated with femininity, sweetness, or romance. Characters who make use of pink may be perceived as gentle, kind, or loving. Brighter shades are often thought of as more playful and innocent, making it a good choice in characters who are youthful or naive. On the other hand, darker shades of pink are often associated with more sensuality, passion, and sometimes
sometimes even danger. This can be useful with designing seductive, alluring, or femme fatale kind of characters. Dark pink could also be used to show a sense of rebellion or non-conformity, making it a good choice for characters who are kind of bold and who step away from convention. Black is often associated with power, mystery, and sophistication. Characters with black in their design may be thought of as strong, mysterious, and alluring. Black can also represent the absence of color, allowing other colors to stand out in contrast. This can be useful in characters who are understated or when you want to draw attention to other aspects of their design. For example, a character with black hair might have more striking eyes or a vibrant outfit that stands out more as a result. On the other hand, black can also be associated with negativity or evil. This can be useful in designing characters who you want to be more intimidating or dangerous. Black can also convey a sense of rebellion, non-conformity, or darkness, making it a good choice for characters who are defiant. This is why we tend to see more villainous characters using black as such an emphasis in their designs. White is a color that's often associated with purity, innocence, and cleanliness. Characters with white in their design might be seen as honest or virtuous. White can represent a blank slate, and much like black, it can allow other colors or aspects to stand out stronger. It's especially useful in characters who have a more minimalist aesthetic. For example, a character with a simple white outfit might have unique accessories or a distinctive facial feature that wants to stand out. On the other hand, white can also be associated with emptiness or detachment. This could be useful in designing characters who are cold, distant, and though it's not used as often as black is, even for villainous characters. White can also convey a sense of authority or power, making it a good choice for characters who are leaders or figureheads. For example, a strict or uncompromising authority figure might have a crisp white uniform to show their no-nonsense approach. The nearly unlimited combination of colors, hues, and shades allow for a massive amount of characterization, but then you can consider mixing and matching with other combinations, and suddenly there is an unending amount of possibilities for what you want to associate with your character. But this is even further supplemented when it's combined with the wardrobe that is being used for them. MHA uses character clothing as a significant aspect of design to express personalities and backgrounds of its characters. Wardrobe often takes into account individual style, interests, and uniquely important for MHA specifically, the character's quirks. For example, Deku often wears plain and practical outfits, reflecting his humble and hardworking nature. In contrast, Bakugo typically wears more flashy clothing to match his explosive personality. The character's costumes also play a essential role in their abilities and powers, each using a unique costume that reflects their quirks or enhances their powers. For instance, Ochako's costume is designed to complement her gravity manipulating quirk, Zero Gravity. Her costume is lightweight and streamlined, allowing her to move quickly and easily through the air, and it also includes specialized shoes that help her control her movement while floating. Additionally, the costumes of the characters in MHA often incorporate elements of traditional Japanese clothing or pop culture references, adding depth and interest to the character's design. For example, Ingenium's costume features elements of samurai armor. Of course, wardrobe extends beyond just the hero costume and includes general clothing as well, which in MHA's case tends to be school uniforms in most cases, but not always. When looking at clothes, there are several aspects which can be considered to demonstrate different personalities and mindsets. If a character is wearing tight clothing, they're often more confident, bold, or comfortable with their body. It can also suggest physical prowess or an emphasis on speed and agility. If they're wearing loose clothing, then they're often more laid back, relaxed, and easygoing. It can also suggest that they value comfort over style or defense over offense. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, a change in costume can be emblematic or symbolic of a character's growth. And in the same way that color and wardrobe are relevant, so too is the character's hairstyle. Hair can be used to convey a lot about who the character is. The length of a character's hair can be indicative of age, gender, or social status. For example, long hair is often associated with femininity, while short hair is associated with masculinity. Characters with longer hair may be more romantic or traditional, while shorter hair might be seen as more practical or efficient. The style of a character's hair can be used to communicate their personality and traits as well. Characters with spiky or messy hair might be seen as more rebellious or carefree, while characters with sleek and neat hairstyles might be more refined or sophisticated. If they have bold and unconventional hairstyles, they might be more creative or individualistic. Then you have hair color, obviously taking into account everything we talked about in the color section, but characters with brighter hair color, such as pink or purple, might be more quirky and playful.
playful, while characters with darker hairstyle might be more serious, brooding, or mysterious. Hair color, especially in anime, can often be used to differentiate characters from each other, making them easy to distinguish and recognize. It's why a lot of protagonists, or other important characters, have hair colors which make them stand out. Hair and wardrobe in general can also be accessorized with things like headbands, ribbons, hats, bracelets, necklaces, ties, purses, and a million other things, which can further convey a character's personality. For example, a character with a bow in their hair might be seen as more cute and innocent, while a character wearing a baseball cap might be seen as more adventurous or daring. Moving down from the hair, we have the character's actual face. Anime in general is known for expressive faces, which often convey a wide range of emotions, from joy and excitement to anger and sadness. These expressions are important for conveying the character's thoughts and feelings, as well as adding depth and nuance to their interactions with other characters. The shape of a character's face, eyes, nose, and mouth can play a huge role in that character's design. For example, characters with large, expressive eyes may be seen as more innocent or vulnerable, while characters with smaller, more narrow eyes might be seen as calculating or mysterious. Similarly, characters with rounded, softer facial features may be seen as more approachable or friendly, while characters with more angular and sharp features might be seen as more intimidating and powerful. And in addition to facial expression, anime characters often use exaggerated body language to convey emotions and intentions. This may include dramatic gestures, poses, or movements to help communicate that character's personality and mood. And of course, a character's posture also plays into this. For example, a character with a slouched or hunched over posture may be seen as more introverted or insecure, while a character with an upright and confident posture might be seen as more assertive and self-assured. Look at All Might versus Small Might, for example. Characters with open, relaxed postures might be more approachable and friendly, while characters with closed, tense postures might be more guarded and defensive. Gestures can be used to emphasize a character's emotions or to convey a specific message as well. Is a character known for waving their arms in excitement or raising their eyebrow in skepticism? Or like in Deku's case, are they known to talk to themselves and fidget nervously when they think? On a larger scale, we can also look at movement. A character who moves with grace and fluidity might be seen as more elegant or refined, while a character who moves with quick, sharp motions might be more dynamic and aggressive. Movement can also be used to emphasize a character's emotional state, such as a character who moves very slowly, displaying that they might feel sad or depressed. And with all of those bases covered, I want to take a look at a few characters specifically and deep dive into their designs with everything we've talked about in mind. And I'll try to grab people from all over, so we'll go with Mirio, Lady Nagant, and Dobby. Starting with Mirio Togata. Mirio plays a very interesting role when he's first introduced, as he's presented as a mentor for Class 1A, but he has a much more dynamic role involving Deku specifically. Mirio was supposed to be the first choice for inheriting One for All, but Deku's act of bravery inspired All Might to pass it to him instead. Because of this, Deku initially compares himself to Mirio and questions if All Might had made a mistake by not choosing him. And this is reinforced when we, as the audience, compare their frames. Deku, again, was a very small, scraggly kid who needed to grow into One for All. And even when he does, his body really isn't ready for it. But then you have Mirio, coming in around six feet tall, just a pile of muscle, broad shoulders, narrow waist. He looks like a young All Might, and that is intentional. Where Deku is often more nervous and anxious, Mirio moves very confidently and assertively. His posture is always perfect. He stands tall and proud. And just like in All Might's case, his face is kind of different. Mirio's eyes, much like All Might's, but in an obviously different way, are drawn in a unique style compared to every other character in the series. There's no iris or pupil to speak of, and it's almost like those old rubber hose cartoons. It's both fun and nostalgic, but the minimalistic design allows for it to look more serious and focused. It is comforting both in a pleasant way, but also in a reassuring one. He's got this very round, approachable, friendly face with short, spiky hair that gives off an energetic and dynamic feeling. And same with his body, which you definitely see in how he fights. He's constantly diving into the ground, making big, quick, sweeping motions. His entire character is seemingly built around the idea of friendliness, seriousness, and reliability. The colors that make up his hero costume are heavily emphasized on white, with large swaths of red and blue and accents of green and yellow. When broken down, you get traits like virtue, boldness, calm, reassurance, growth, and optimism, which all fit fairly well for his character. And a heavy emphasis on bright and primary 
ordinary colors like this can show off a sense of simplicity and straightforwardness that can also demonstrate a strong sense of self and a clear understanding of goals and motivations. And this is reinforced in Mirio's hero name, Lumillion, making it his mission to save one million people within his lifetime. This name isn't just a vow to himself, but it also lets everyone in the world around him know that they will be safe if he's around. Every element of his character design feeds into the rest of itself, and it all stems from the kind of person Mirio is. And I think that while he admittedly looks a little bit silly, he's overall designed phenomenally well. Next, let's take a look at Lady Nagant, an ex-pro hero who had been trained to assassinate villains or other heroes who were becoming corrupt. Although the definition of corrupt here often came down to her superior's discretion. Basically, the world was idolizing All Might as the symbol who kept peace, while Nagant was working behind the scenes, becoming jaded by the horrific killings she would have to perform to support the illusion of a safe world that was being presented. Eventually, she would reach her breaking point and tried to quit, but her superiors would threaten her in response and ultimately led her to killing them and being locked away as a fallen hero. So we're working with an assassin, someone who's become jaded, who's been betrayed, and who held the burden of the darkness of society so that no one else would have to experience it. Now, how do we reflect that in her design? Well, Lady Nagant has an elegant and refined appearance. She has a slender frame that gives a sense of grace and poise. She has short, wavy indigo hair with streaks of pink running through it, adding a subtle touch of femininity or optimism to an otherwise sharp and stoic look. As we've discussed, short hair is often a sign of functionality over form. Indigo, or this deep purple, is often seen as a sign of wisdom, intuition, and sadness, but also gives an air of mystery as well. Her outfit consists of a long purple dress adorned with gold lining that adds to that grandeur of her appearance, while also showcasing the elegance and finesse that you might expect from an assassin. The color scheme of her outfit is predominantly purple and gold, which are associated with royalty, nobility, and further emphasizes her regal demeanor. And of course, all of these dark colors lean into the life experiences that she's had. In terms of her personality, Lady Nagant's design suggests a cold and calculated demeanor with her sharp angles and stoic expression. The regal appearance of her outfit suggests a sense of superiority and authority, which is fitting for someone who was once a hero and an assassin. Her design implies a sense of discipline and precision, which is in line with her being a marksman. And much like Deku, we can also see the toll that experiencing the darker bits of hero society has taken on her character. A young Lady Nagant had much longer hair, she was more hopeful, her face was more rounded and friendly looking. As she became a hero, we see her looking more mature, a lot more sharp line work in her face as she's still excited about being a hero, very similar to Deku's first actual hero costume. However, as she learns what's really happening, as she becomes disillusioned and betrayed, all of the hope of her design is sucked out. Her hair is cut short, the innocence is gone, and in its place we have melancholy and sternness. We only get a glimpse of her past, but they really help to flesh out her character arc so that we can see how her design has been impacted by it. And finally, Dobby. Dobby's character design is a striking and complex one, full of subtle details that hint at his personality, backstory, and motivations. His appearance is both intimidating and tragic, with a burned and scarred face that reflects his painful past, and as we later find out, his rage against his father endeavor. Dobby has a lean and muscular build with a tall and imposing figure, and this often makes him stand out amongst the other characters. His skin is blackened and charred with patches of burned flesh visible on his arms, torso, and face. His eyes are sharp, piercing, and icy blue, which leans into his calculated and cold mentality. Ironic for his quirk. The shapes used in Dobby's design tend to be sharp and angular, reflecting a very aggressive and dangerous person. His hair is styled in a spiky, unkempt manner that adds to his rough and rebellious appearance. His body language is very controlled and deliberate, with smooth and graceful movements, which makes his iconic dance scene so unsettling as he suddenly begins to move in these jagged, haphazard ways. His clothing is dark and rugged, it's torn and frayed, and it gives him this edgy, vagabond kind of look, while at the same time the blue and black color scheme hint at a darker story from the first time that we meet him. The brooding, deep tones of his costume also suggest that he is a force to be reckoned with and that he's not to be taken lightly. Dobby is dangerous, he's rough, and he's damaged beyond repair, and as the metal clasping the skin on his face together might suggest, he is barely holding it together. 
Horikoshi obviously doesn't make every character perfectly. Some designs are much better and much more detailed than others, and some are questionable, let's call it. But as an all-encompassing piece, I think My Hero Academia demonstrates an excellent portrayal of all the tools artists have at their disposal being brought together to bring these characters to life. By combining all the details of the world-famous swoofs process, he's able to present characters who wear their personalities, ambitions, and abilities on their sleeves. We get a sense of exactly who these characters are before even knowing anything about them. And while MHA definitely suffers from plenty of shortcomings, I think that at least on this metric, it is something really great that any artist could take inspiration or learn from. Oh, and also the police chief is a dog, which isn't really a teachable design choice, but it is pretty rad. With that said though, I hope you all enjoyed this video, and until next time, remember to stay excellent.